joining us tonight. <clears throat> so the first uh, topic is pediatric uh, abuse and child abuse. It is one of the uh, um, areas that are covered quite heavily within the examination, and certainly on the in-training examination and uh, uh, also on the boards. We'll start with the first question. <clears throat> what are the two most common lesions seen in abused children? So, so to get this answer right, or to get this question right, you'll need to know some things about child abuse. Uh, one of the things that you'll need to know are those signs to look for, uh, including uh, multiple fractures in various stages of healing, uh, corner fractures, which are fractures that result from a twisting mechanism to a limb, uh, and you can see a, a, a nice illustration of that on this x-ray with both the black and the white arrow uh, illustrating the uh, um, healing corner fracture, which is really a fracture at the uh, metaphyseal physeal junction. <clears throat> Multiple bruises and skin lesions are very common in children uh, who suffer from child abuse. In fact, they are uh, among the most common things. Uh, a history of an unwitnessed injury. Uh, as well as uh, long bone fractures and non-walkers or children under 18 months of age. Um, the most important thing from an orthopedic standpoint is to be able to recognize those injury patterns and uh, also to uh, order the skeletal survey and get a social worker or a social service unit uh, involved. Uh, in most uh, medical centers this involves the pediatric surgery unit. So uh, on this x-ray you can see that uh, uh, this is a distal humeral physeal separation. The way we can tell that is the uh, disconnect between the distal humeral metaphysis and the proximal radius and ulna. The proximal radius and ulna appear to be in an appropriate relationship, and the proximal radius is still pointing to the capitellum, which you can see, just barely see behind the distal humeral metaphysis. Uh, and the radius and ulna are together like they should be, but uh, they are dissociated from the distal uh, humeral physis, or distal humeral metaphysis. So in abused children, the most common lesions seen are skin lesions and fractures, and that's response number two, and most of you got that right, so good job. The next question, a two-year-old male is brought to the emergency room complaining of pain in the left elbow. Radiographs are shown in figures A and B. This injury pattern should raise concern for which of the following. And so similar to the last question, you can see on this x-ray, the proximal radius and the proximal ulna are both in appropriate alignment. And the proximal radius is pointing toward the capitellum as it should in all views of the elbow. Uh, and you can see on the lateral x-ray as well uh, that the proximal radius is pointing toward uh, the capitellum and uh, is in an appropriate relationship with the proximal ulna. Uh, but both of them appear to be dislocated from the distal humeral metaphysis. And so this is a distal humeral uh, physeal separation. <clears throat> Once again, uh, it's important to recognize the injuries that are associated with child abuse, uh, including the ones that we talked about. Uh, you also have to be aware of uh, humeral physeal separation as well as posterior rib fractures, uh, uh, in addition to the ones that we talked about, about the last topic. So once again, a two-year-old is brought to the emergency room with pain in the elbow. Radiographs show a distal humeral physeal separation, and this should raise concerns for child abuse, which is number five. Once again, almost. Next is osteomyelitis, which you can see is another um, <clears throat> uh, topic which is heavily covered in the in-training examination as well as on the boards. So the question is defined as which of the following? So, so um, we'll spend a little time going over some information about infection because this is, uh, like I said, a topic where it's heavily tested. So osteomyelitis is a common cause of limb pain. And often there's a remote history of trauma associated with this, uh, which uh, makes sense because uh, trauma frequently will uh, create a hematoma, which is then seeded uh, by uh, <clears throat> the uh, transient bacteremia that we all have at all, uh, in, in everyday activities. So hematogenous uh, infection or hematogenous seeding is the method uh, by which this occurs. And this occurs in children uh, more than adults because of their anatomy. Uh, that uh, consists of these uh, end uh, arterial loops uh, in the metaphysis just proximal to the physis. And so in these regions, they get metaphyseal sludging. Uh, children have an incompetent immune system, and so they have a deficient reticular endothelial system, so their ability to fight infection in this region is also diminished. 
<clears throat> because of the uh, end uh, vascular loops, there is increased vascular permeability. So all these things are a setup for infection. Uh, and typically this starts in the metaphysis of the long bones. The organisms are a little bit dependent on uh, the environment or the, uh, uh, and the age of the patient. Uh, so Staph aureus continues to be the most common organism that we see uh, causing infection. Uh, it is uh, uh, becoming more frequent that this is a community acquired methicillin resistant Staph aureus um, in some locations. Kingella kinge is another uh, common pathogen that we see uh, in <clears throat> cases where uh, their culture doesn't immediately show anything. Uh, so you have to be sure that uh, in those cases that the, the laboratory continues to hold that uh, culture uh, and uh, also inoculates it into a CO2 rich medium um, because this can be a fastidious and slow growing organism. Uh, in neonates, uh, group B strep and gram negative organisms are a frequent cause of infection and they ask this uh, frequently on the test as well. Um, in sickle cell disease, salmonella uh, is uh, the organism that is associated with it, although Staph aureus is still the most common organism uh, for osteomyelitis in these people. Haemophilus uh, influenza is uh, now a uncommon uh, cause of infection. It used to be a very common cause in the, old, in the younger child that due to the vaccine it has uh, essentially been eradicated as a uh, pathogen in uh, osteomyelitis. Uh, it does appear in uh, those populations, however, that have not uh, immunized their children. Uh, terminology is important to know as well. Uh, involucrum is a term that's used to describe new bone that's formed uh, in an effort by the body to uh, sequester uh, the uh, infection or uh, to uh, uh, wall it off. Uh, the sequestrum uh, is the nidus of residual necrotic infected bone which is, try which is being walled off. Uh, operative treatment of chronic osteomyelitis requires excision of the sequestrum. Once again, uh, returning to the question, you can see that uh, the correct answer is three, uh, that sequestrum is the necrotic uh, bone, uh, which is a nidus for infection uh, in chronic osteomyelitis, and most of you got that right as well. Moving on, a seven-year-old boy complains of worsening left knee pain over the last two weeks. He has been unable to bear weight through the left lower extremity for the past 24 hours. The knee and lower leg are warm and tender to palpation. Current temperature is 100.9 degrees Fahrenheit, <clears throat> CRP is 11, which is elevated. A radiograph is provided in figure A. A joint aspiration yields two cc's of synovial fluid, demonstrating a cell count of 2,500. That's pretty unimpressive. And or no organisms on gram stain. Which of the following is the most appropriate next step in management? So the radiograph they provide for you there uh, shows an AP view of bilateral knees. Uh, with normal physes. <clears throat> Clearly this is a skeletally immature individual and the patella also look uh, normal and the, the x-rays uh, seem uh, normal on, on both uh, limbs. So <clears throat> osteomyelitis is a uh, uh, problem uh, that we see that presents clinically with warm uh, tender swollen limbs uh, or a limb if it's one side of infection. Uh, there may be a history of antecedent trauma. Uh, typically they present with a limp or the unwillingness or inability to walk. Uh, they often have a fever. Uh, the laboratory markers that are uh, indicative of this uh, process uh, include uh, an elevated white count, uh, an elevated sedimentation rate, and an elevated C-reactive protein. And so these are important things uh, to be aware of and to order clinically. Uh, radiographs are often not very helpful in the early period. Uh, even up to two weeks after uh, injury uh, before they start to show some signs. Uh, MRI can be a very helpful imaging modality to help guide aspiration and also in those scenarios uh, where there's not an obvious uh, area uh, that seems to be causing the discomfort or pain. So it's important to know that uh, the temporal relationship between CRP and sed rate. So sedimentation rate is typically uh, something that uh, uh, rises a little bit more slowly and remains elevated for much longer, whereas uh, C-reactive protein uh, is elevated very early in the course of infection and then dramatically uh, declines uh, after treatment is initiated. Uh, 
So the, uh, the time course for elevation and then a decline of CRP is a much better marker for early response to infection, whereas SED rate is something that's used as a, uh, a tracking uh, lab for uh, long-term uh, antibiotic therapy. <clears throat> so once again, a seven-year-old boy with knee pain over a couple of weeks with unwillingness to bear weight over the last 24 hours, so worsening knee pain. There's warmth and tenderness. Uh, he is febrile has an elevated CRP and a negative uh, joint aspiration. So in this uh, scenario, they're trying to tell you that there is an infectious process going on, but uh, it doesn't sound like it is septic arthritis uh, because the aspiration is normal. Uh, and so <clears throat> uh, the uh, correct answer is three, and most of you got that question right. This is Clubfoot. Three-year-old boy has been treated in the past with Ponseti casting, now presents with dynamic supination during gait. You're planning to perform an anterior tibialis transfer to the lateral column, or the lateral cuneiform. All of the following are true, except, so clubfoot is idiopathic in nature, uh, although the genetics are still being worked out, uh, there may be some familial association. Uh, anatomically, it's hindfoot quinovarus, forefoot supination and adductus, and midfoot cavus. You can see this photograph of a child with uh, bilateral uh, club feet um, with the typical posture of the hind foot, uh, a supinated adducted forefoot, uh, and uh, it's difficult to see whether there's cavus there or not. So the treatment consists uh, typically of uh, serial casting uh, via the Ponsetti method. And the Ponsetti method uh, emphasizes gentle manipulation in a stepwise fashion and correction of the deformities uh, also in a stepwise fashion, starting with correction of the cavus and uh, then progressing to correction of the adductus uh, as well as the varus and equinus of the hind foot uh, last uh, after uh, abduction of uh, 50 to 60 degrees is achieved. <clears throat> the casts are usually long leg casts. In fact, they're always long leg casts from hip to, hip to toes. And so uh, the mnemonic cave is a good way to remember the order of correction. Serial casting is usually followed by tenotomy at six to eight weeks after uh, the initiation of casting and then uh, uh, some form of abduction bracing for up to two to four years. Tibialis, uh, tibialis anterior transfer is uh, a common procedure. It, it is necessary in 10 to 30 percent of patients uh, who have uh, feet that are treated in this method uh, for recurrence uh, and typically occurs after the age of about two uh, in the age range from two to five years. Uh, the things that you'll see clinically in a child who may need a tibialis anterior tendon transfer uh, are that uh, they will have lateral weight bearing. They'll also have tibialis anterior activity in both swing and stance phase, uh, and they have to have a flexible deformity. So this is not an effective uh, method of treatment if the deformity is not flexible. So knowing this, a three-year-old who has previously been treated now has a, a recurrence with dynamic supination. Uh, you're planning a tib ant tendon transfer to the lateral cuneiform, which is the usual site. Um, the preferred response is four, so this is an accept question. So all of the other answers are things that you uh, that are true. Uh, Subtalar rigidity uh, is a contraindication to performing the transfer, and so most of you got that right as well. Sixteen-year-old female complains of foot pain with ambulation. She previously underwent clubfoot uh, soft tissue releases at five months of age. Each of the following are complications or late deformities associated with clubfoot surgery, except. So this is a question that may be a little bit challenging for some of you because the Ponsetti method has become so popular as a form of treatment uh, that many uh, of the post-surgical problems that we used to be seen quite commonly in pediatric orthopedics uh, fortunately have uh, gone away. Uh, but uh, it's still important to know the answer to this question <clears throat> because there's still lots of patients out there. Uh, Post-surgical deformities include uh, those that are due to undercorrection or recurrence, and that includes uh, medial spin in in-towing uh, as well as recurrent equinus. Um, or the other family of uh, problems that are seen as a result of treatment uh, is uh, overcorrection. And so overcorrection is, a, is typically a rigid flat foot deformity with hind foot valgus, uh, calcaneus gait, uh, and weak uh, push-off. 
Uh, in addition, because of the extensive nature of the release, there's damage to the vascular supply of the talus. There can also be an injury uh, to the perineus longus, uh, which results in the dorsal bunion and dorsiflexion of the first ray. Uh, stiffness is common, as is pain. So knowing that, <clears throat> we see that uh, dorsal bunion is listed as an answer for uh, uh, secondary deformity, as is osteonecrosis of the talus, rigid flat foot, in-toeing gait, but tarsal tunnel syndrome is in is, is a deformity that is not seen uh, following uh, surgical uh, release of the club foot. Uh, I can see that only 35% of you uh, answered that uh, question correctly, and I think that's a reflection, as I said, of uh, the fact that these patients are, are not as common uh, as they used to be. Uh, but it's important still to know uh, what kind of iatrogenic or post-surgical problems uh, still occur. Next is femur fracture. Which of the following patients would be the best candidate for submuscular bridge plating? So this is a question that uh, really covers the topic of treatment of femur fractures in the ambulatory child uh, or the uh, child who is school age. Uh, so children in between the ages of 5 and 11 have a variety of treatment options uh, for treating their femur fractures. Uh, and the uh, decision making criteria isn't always straightforward. Uh, and making these decisions depends on uh, a variety of factors, including the age and maturity of the patient, the weight of the patient, the length stability of the fracture, the location of the fracture, whether it is proximal third, diaphyseal, or distal third, and the presence or absence of polytrauma or multiple extremity injuries in one patient. Last, uh, surgeon comfort is an important thing to consider as well uh, because obviously uh, whatever is most uh, uh, <clears throat> facile in your hands and that you can do well uh, is probably the best choice for the patient. So this is an example of a uh, submuscular bridge plate, uh, which is one of the options for a length unstable fracture. So length unstable fractures are those with uh, comminution or uh, a large oblique uh, fracture pattern. And these uh, typically are treated with open reduction internal fixation with plating, minimally invasive or submuscular plating, as well as possibly external fixation and occasionally in the upper ends of this age range or in the larger children uh, with uh, reamed rigid uh, intramedullary nails uh, that, are, uh, that have a trochanteric starting point. So back to the question, um, the best candidate for submuscular bridge plating, you can see uh, the preferred response is three, which is a child who's in the upper age limit who is above the nail or above the weight uh, restriction that's recommended for uh, treatment using flexible intramedullary nails, uh, but also with a length unstable uh, fracture that requires <clears throat> an implant that's going to hold it out to length. Uh, so three is the correct response, and most of you got that right. Next, medial epicondyle fractures. A physician from an emergency room at a referring hospital calls you about a pediatric patient with a closed elbow dislocation. Which of the following fracture patterns, figures A through E, is most commonly associated with a pediatric elbow dislocation? So you can see here that they have a variety of injuries represented. The first um, x-ray on the left uh, is an example of uh, a supracondylar humerus fracture uh, with perhaps an associated lateral condyle fracture. Um, the next is a, a medial epicondyle fracture. You can see that the medial epicondyle is displaced uh, in an older child. The one next to that, uh, moving from left to right, is a uh, displaced uh, type 2 supracondylar humerus fracture, which is an extension type injury there. Above that to the uh, uh, right is a uh, badly displaced type 3 supracondylar humerus fracture. And below that is a um, montasia fracture with a proximal uh, ulnar shaft fracture and an associated anterior radial head dislocation. So, so medial epicondyle fractures uh, result from an avulsion uh, by the uh, uh, flexor pronator muscular wad. Uh, and uh, they <clears throat> uh, have uh, some controversy regarding treatment of these types of injuries. Uh, Open reduction internal fixation is indicated uh, for those injuries that have uh, been entrapped in the joint following an elbow dislocation. An elbow dislocation is a common uh, associated injury with this 
uh, type of fracture. And in fact, any time an elbow dislocation is recognized in a child, you have to be concerned that there might be an associated medial epicondyle fracture. Uh, the true displacement uh, is usually seen on an oblique film. This is usually an internal oblique x-ray. You have to be aware that the ulnar nerve may have been dragged into the um, joint uh, after a reduction of the elbow if the uh, fragment is uh, contained within the joint as well. Uh, displace displacement of uh, 2 to 10 millimeters has been cited as an indication for treatment. Uh, so there's quite a bit of variety and really no consensus on um, how much displacement is uh, enough uh, to necessitate treatment and it depends a lot on the activity as well as the hand dominance of the uh, uh, injured child. So you can see these x-rays, uh, the two above show uh, an elbow dislocation that has been reduced with uh, the medial epicondylar fragment uh, visible within the joint and you can see the capitellar ossification center which is normal uh, and just uh, medial to that is the medial epicondyle fragment which is entrapped within the joint. And on the lateral x-ray you can see as well uh, that the uh, medial epicondyle fracture uh, which should be posterior on that lateral film uh, at the level of the bottom of what appears to be the hourglass uh, pattern of ossification in the distal humeral metaphysis uh, is uh, at the level of the capitellum and within the joint. And below you can see the C-arm images after this fracture has been reduced uh, and uh, the elbow uh, is now uh, concentrically reduced as well. And you can see just a hint of an air arthrogram as well, just distal to the capitillum on the AP and the lateral views. So, so back to the question, uh, a pediatric patient with an elbow dislocation, uh, which fracture pattern is associated with it? And we now know that that is a medial epicondyle fracture. And you can see another example of that. Uh, on this x-ray with the medial epicondyle being uh, outlined by the black arrow and its uh, normal bed uh, being outlined by the white arrow uh, as well as the presence of this fracture dislocation. About two-thirds of you got that question right. Uh, the most common wrong answer was the uh, Montasia fracture. It's just important to know that uh, what they're talking about is true elbow dislocation uh, of the ulna humeral joint and not uh, a radial head dislocation. Next is lateral condyle fractures. An eight-year-old boy falls on his right upper extremity and presents to the emergency room with the radiographs shown in figures A and B. He has exquisite tenderness to palpation along the lateral aspect of his elbow. What additional radiographic view will likely demonstrate the maximum degree of fracture displacement? As you can see on the radiographs that are provided, <coughs> uh, it's not uh, clear-cut exactly what the injury pattern is. Um, uh, uh, the radial uh, head is well aligned with the capitellum. Uh, the proximal ulna is well aligned with the distal humerus. The medial epicondyle appears to be in its appropriate position. You can see just a hint of a fracture line in the metaphysis proximal to the capitellum in the lateral condyle, uh, which many times on the AP film is very difficult to detect. Uh, similarly, on the lateral x-ray, it's very difficult to see um, the, the displacement of the fracture. The lateral condyle fractures are the second most common uh, fractures around the elbow in children. Um, they are really divided into those fractures that have a, an articular hinge which keeps them non-displaced or minimally displaced and makes it a stable injury versus those uh, where the fracture line extends from the metaphysis all the way into the joint across the articular uh, surface. And so this is a uh, displaced intraarticular injury with uh, uh, synovial fluid bathing it. And so uh, this is at high risk for non-union. Uh, so x-ray evaluation of lateral condyle fracture should include internal rotation oblique images as well. Uh, an MRI or an arthrogram can be useful to visualize that hinge. Um, initial treatment for those minimally displaced injuries can be splinting followed by casting with frequent follow-up and very close follow-up. Um, in fact, they should probably be x-rayed weekly until uh, you can see bridging fracture callus uh, over the metaphysis. Uh, displaced fractures uh, typically require open reduction and internal fixation through a lateral approach. Uh, posterior lateral dissection should be avoided as this is the source of the blood supply of the distal uh, lateral uh, humerus and the lateral condyle. Um, the complication that's most commonly described uh, in this 
the most commonly talked about, although it's not the most common complication, is non-union, which leads to cubitus valgus uh, and subsequent tardy ulnar nerve palsy. You can see that, uh, uh, once again, uh, the child with the lateral condyle fracture, which view will, will uh, show his uh, uh, fracture displacement the greatest, and it's the internal oblique radiograph. And you can see that answer two uh, was uh, achieved by about two-thirds of you. About a third of you said the external oblique radiograph, and uh, that's uh, just one of those things that needs to be, uh, that you have to commit to memory. Uh, Next is infantile Blount's disease. 32 month old male with severe infantile Blount's disease has been treated with full time bracing for the past year. At most recent follow up, the various deformity of his bilateral legs has worsened despite compliance with bracing. What treatment is now recommended? So, infantile Blount's disease is progressive infantile tibia vera. Uh, it affects the proximal medial tibial uh, physis and epiphysis. Uh, typically, the onset is prior to three years of age. Uh, the hallmark is that it is a progressive worsening of their pre-existing genuvarum that most children are born with. Uh, Lang and Scholl classification uh, has been described uh, to uh, uh, describe not necessarily the severity of the injury, but the maturity of the patient as well. And so, uh, by Lang and Scholl's criteria, type one are those children who are very early in the process and may have uh, just uh, some medial beaking without a true step off of the metaphysis. Type 2 shows a step off of the metaphysis. Type 3 starts to show some ossification and drooping down of the epiphysis. Type 4, 5, and 6 are showing uh, progressive uh, deformity and bar formation of the proximal medial tibia. Uh, the metaphyseal diaphyseal angle as described by Gren Drennan uh, is useful and is a, really a measure of the obliquity of the proximal metaphysis relative to the uh, the proximal tibial shaft. Uh, an angle greater than 13 uh, is uh, representative of a situation where the child needs uh, continuing follow-up. Uh, greater than 16 has been described as uh, children who are all destined for progression. Those less than 11 almost all resolve. So surgical treatment for infantile Blount's disease uh, is indicated in those patients who have failed bracing. Uh, those children who are lying in shoulder stage three or greater um, and or uh, unresponsive or, or, or with late presentation uh, despite uh, no bracing. These children will have uh, best results if their proximal tib fib osteotomy uh, is uh, done before the age of four. Uh, technically, uh, the osteotomy should be done to overcorrect the proximal tibia into valgus of five to ten degrees. In addition, because many times these children have associated internal tibial torsion, a rotational correction is necessary. Uh, because of the high risk of uh, compartment syndrome uh, uh, due to the uh, uh, proximity to the proximal uh, uh, calf vasculature and the recurrent vessels to the interosseous membrane, uh, a prophylactic anterior compartment uh, or four, four compartment fasciotomy should be performed. Older children, um, or children who've had recurrence may need physial bar resection as well. Getting back to the question, a less than three-year-old child with severe Blount's disease has failed bracing. Uh, and now the uh, <clears throat> next step in treatment is uh, uh, pro bilateral proximal uh, tib-fib osteotomies, and that's response number three, and most of you got that right. This is distal femoral physial fracture. An 11-year-old boy underwent surgical intervention for the injury shown in figure A two years ago. He currently does not complain of knee pain, but the parents have noticed a progressive bow leg deformity. Physical examination reveals five degrees of varus relative to the contralateral side. Current radiographs are provided figure B. Physial mapping via CT demonstrates a bar involving 25% of the physis. The remainder of the physis is open. Which of the following is the most appropriate treatment? So the radiograph on the left uh, in figure A shows a uh, Salter-Harris II injury to the distal femoral metaphysis uh, that's displaced. And you can see there's a large thurston holland fragment laterally. This uh, after treatment, uh, which was uh, treatment with reduction uh, and uh, some type of fixation, uh, shows that there is uh, 
a varus deformity uh, with uh, continued growth laterally, but a asymmetric growth arrest medially. So, distal femoral physial injury uh, <clears throat> is more common than ligamentous injury in children because of the epiphyseal ligamentous attachment of the distal uh, uh, femoral physis. So the cruciate and the medial and lateral collateral ligaments all attach in the uh, epiphysis and do not uh, bridge the physis. Uh, thus, uh, uh, a, a traumatic injury in this region results in physial fracture and not ligamentous injury in most cases. Uh, MRI and ultrasound are useful for identifying uh, displacement of the fracture or fractures uh, that may be uh, displaced and then spontaneously reduced. Stress radiographs are still uh, occasionally used, although uh, MRI and ultrasound are more frequently used now. Uh, you have to understand there's a very high incidence of physial arrest with these injuries, um, and up to 30 to 50 percent of these injuries can lead to physial arrest. If this is a non-displaced injury uh, that is stable, uh, close reduction and long leg casting uh, can be appropriate. Uh, most uh, cases require reduction um, and pinning. Uh, the pinning can be extra physial if possible with a uh, large uh, Thurston Holland fragment like the uh, case that was displayed. Um, if, the, if it is a Salter Harris 1 type injury or a Salter Harris 2 with a small metaphyseal fragment, then smooth pin fixation that crosses the physis is appropriate. Now, physial arrest uh, uh, is something that uh, uh, can be treated in a variety of ways. And it depends on the nature of the arrest and the age of the child. So partial arrest typically results in an angular deformity. And so partial arrest uh, is uh, amenable to bar resection uh, if uh, there is greater than 2 centimeters of growth remaining and less than 50% of uh, the physis is involved. Uh, if <clears throat> there is uh, greater than 50% physial involvement or less than 2 centimeters of growth remaining, then it's probably best to proceed with uh, completion uh, of the growth arrest and contralateral uh, pipsiodesis. And depending on the age of the child, uh, this may lead to either a, a leg length discrepancy that might require uh, 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 lengthening versus uh, pipsiodesis to equalize leg lengths. You can see on the radiograph here uh, a distal tibial physial bar that has undergone resection and, and restoration of alignment and continued growth. to the question, an 11-year-old boy who had a distal femoral physial injury with a resultant asymmetric growth arrest and now has 25% of his physis uh, that is closed, um, which is less than the criteria uh, that uh, it would be an indication for continuing with treatment uh, by resection, and he has greater than two centimeters of growth potential. So I think this is one that would be a good candidate for a physial bridge resection with PMMA interposition. And the PMMA is there to occupy the space uh, of, around the physis, uh, and it's used to uh, maintain uh, uh, a growing physis and a marker for growth as well. Next are distal radius fractures. An eight-year-old boy fell while riding his bike and landed on his outstretched arm. Radiographs are provided in figure A. Which of the following increases the risk of displacement following close reduction and casting? So distal radius fractures uh, can be classified into those that are intraarticular and extraarticular. Extraarticular Salter Harris fractures are typically um, amenable to close reduction and casting with a, a good interosseous mold of the cast. And so the interosseous mold is an important feature to, to be uh, aware of when you're talking about uh, treatment of uh, distal radius as well as forearm fractures. Um, so the interosseous mold can be measured by looking at the cast index, and the cast index is simply a measure of the uh, cast uh, width uh, uh, in the AP plane uh, relative to the cast uh, width uh, in the lateral plane, and it should be skinnier uh, in the lateral plane uh, by about 20% uh, than it, it is in the AP plane. <clears throat> Interarticular Salter Harris fractures uh, typically require open reduction and internal fixation. Torus or buckle fractures uh, can usually be treated with either a short arm cast or even uh, removable splinting. Um, green stick fractures uh, typically require reduction if there's greater than 10 to 15 degrees of deformity, uh, as this does not remodel. So, 
Go back to the question. Uh, the boy fell uh, and landed uh, on his outstretched arm and sustained a distal uh, radius fracture. Uh, the likelihood of uh, placement uh, depends on uh, good interosseous mold, so a cast index uh, which is uh, greater than 0.85 uh, increases the risk uh, of that uh, fracture displacing. About half of you got that answer right. Uh, the other uh, half answered that a long arm uh, cast was uh, necessary and a short arm cast was a poor choice for this kind of an injury. Uh, but I think uh, the literature reflects the fact that uh, short arm casting is appropriate for these types of injuries if it is a, a well uh, molded and well placed cast with a uh, uh, low cast index. Next, cerebral palsy. In patients with cerebral palsy, voluntary control of motion best predicts improvement in function after which of the following? So in the upper extremity <clears throat> of children with cerebral palsy, there are some characteristic deformities. These include sh shoulder internal rotation, elbow flexion contracture, pronation contracture of the forearm, uh, wrist flexion and ulnar deviation deformity, thumb and palm deformity, as well as swan neck deformity of the fingers. Reasons to treat uh, in these patients include uh, uh, improvement of hygiene in those kids who have uh, severe contractures of the uh, elbow, which causes uh, a skin maceration and breakdown in the antecubital fossa, or uh, of the wrist and hand, uh, which can cause similar problems in the palm. Um, <clears throat> the uh, other reason to treat uh, for these children is uh, to improve function. And the ability to improve function is relative to the ability of the child to cognitively participate in occupational therapy, as well as to control uh, their own muscular movements. Uh, it increases the utility of that hand as a helper hand uh, if they have better control and better cognition. So getting back to the question, uh, Knowing that, we uh, see that the correct response is answer number three, uh, that uh, the child who has voluntary control uh, is amenable to uh, surgery and tendon transfer uh, of the wrist and hand, and uh, their prognosis is good, and their chances for a good out outcome are quite good as well. Next is Duchenne muscular dystrophy. A nine-year-old boy with Duchenne muscular dystrophy is increasing difficulty with ambulation. He denies back pain, difficulty sitting in a chair, or shortness of breath. Annual screening spine radiographs demonstrate a 20-degree thoracolumbar lumbar curve. Which of the following statements best describes the appropriate treatment plan for his scoliosis? Duchenne muscular dystrophy uh, is an uh, <clears throat> X-linked recessive disorder uh, that uh, it has scoliosis as a large component of the deformity. Uh, the scoliosis and spinal deformity that we see in these children typically progresses after they become wheelchair uh, dependent. Uh, and uh, children uh, who are developing spine deformity uh, are traditionally fused early because of uh, their lower risk of surgery, uh, the smaller magnitude of the operation, and the fact that they are able medically to survive the operation uh, and uh, avoid complication more easily. Uh, so typically these curves are fused prior to reaching 30 degrees in magnitude. Uh, the early fusion improves the quality of their life, but it does not increase the length of their life. You can see on the right uh, a picture of Gower's sign, which is one of the hallmark physical examination findings. And the other things that you'll notice in a child who has Duchenne muscular dystrophy is that they are, uh, have decreased uh, motor skills and they start out uh, essentially with normal skills as an infant, but then with uh, age up to about two to six, they develop um, you know, worsening uh, skills and they uh, lose the ability to keep up with their peers. Calf pseudohypertrophy is one of the common findings. A uh, Gower sign we discussed and the lab finding that is uh, uh, pathognomonic is a markedly elevated uh, CPK. So back to the question. Uh, you can see that the preferred response is number two, spinal fusion prior to the progression of the curve beyond 30 degrees. The other uh, uh, options are <clears throat> indications for surgery in idiopathic scoliosis, as well as uh, uh, one of the answers uh, talks about forced vital capacity, and it's important to know that uh, it's good to operate on these children before their forced vital capacity or their pulmonary function deteriorates.
humeral physial separation. Ten-month-old child f fell off <clears throat> the couch and has a left elbow pain and swelling. A radiograph is shown in figure A. All of the following are characteristics of this injury pattern, except the so distal humeral physial separation uh, happens in young children and is associated with abuse or, or battery. It can be very difficult to diagnose, and sometimes an arthrogram is necessary in order to make the diagnosis. Uh, it looks like an elbow dislocation and is frequently mistaken for, th for this. The only sign can be uh, posterior medial displacement of the forearm relative to the distal humerus. Um, <clears throat> in those injuries that are minimally displaced or non-displaced, <clears throat> a posterior splint and long arm cast uh, are appropriate for treatment. Uh, for those displaced injuries, they're treated like supracondylar humerus fractures with close reduction and percutaneous pinning. You can see on the radiograph here, uh, the radiographic findings that, are, that we discussed, that the proximal ulna and the proximal radius uh, are in appropriate relationship to one another, but both of them seem to be dislocated from the distal humeral uh, metaphysis. Once again, a 10-month-old child who, fa who falls off the couch, has left elbow pain and swelling. Uh, the radiographs show a distal humeral, or a distal humeral physial separation. Um, there is a risk uh, in this uh, type of a uh, uh, fracture for uh, uh, tardy ulnar nerve palsy. Uh, so the perverted response uh, is one. Uh, um, most, uh, there's a lot of uh, disparity in how this uh, uh, question was answered. Um, and I think that uh, there may be some more information uh, that will be discussed uh, later on about this, uh, about this question. <clears throat> Next is flexible flat foot. Flexible flat foot. Um, so the question is, a 12-year-old boy has two years of right foot pain that prevents participation in athletic activities and is symptomatic uh, with walking. He has attempted UCBL and custom orthoses for one year with no relief of symptoms. His hind foot is supple and he has full dorsiflexion. <clears throat> Clinical images of the foot are shown, figures A and B. A lateral radiograph is shown in figure C. A surgical plan to address the deformity would most likely, would most appropriately include which of the following. You can see here there are clinical um, pictures uh, of hind foot uh, in valgus and uh, a lateral view of the foot with a, a diminished uh, arch. Uh, you can also see uh, the radiograph that shows uh, a midfoot sag and uh, the uh, talo uh, first metatarsal uh, relationship, which should be collinear, uh, shows a break and a sag in the midfoot. Uh, you can also see as well uh, that uh, there's flattening uh, uh, of the calcaneal pitch and the uh, calcaneus uh, is in a, a little bit of a flexed uh, position. A flexible flat foot uh, uh, is uh, characterized by a low medial arch, a valgus heel uh, with forefoot abduction. Uh, there is normal uh, subtalar motion uh, in most of these children. If there is not normal subtalar motion, then you have to look for an underlying etiology like tarsal coalition or some other process that is irritating the subtalar joint or limiting subtalar motion. Um, and typically these children uh, don't have heel cord contracture. Uh, but occasionally they can if they are symptomatic, but in flexible flat foot, usually not. Operative treatment for this deformity is rarely indicated, and typically these patients have to fail conservative methods of treatment prior to progressing to any type of surgical treatment. Uh, conservative methods include stretching of the uh, gastroxoleus complex, uh, as well as the use of the orthotics. Uh, the most common surgical procedure is a calcaneal neck lengthening osteotomy. Uh, sometimes uh, this can unmask uh, tightness of the Achilles tendon, which is uh, then necessary uh, for uh, lengthening afterwards. Uh, and then uh, medial cuneiform osteotomy may, be, may also be necessary if the first ray remains uh, supinated and a uh, dorsal uh, opening wedge uh, osteotomy uh, restores the first ray relationship. So back to the question, a 12-year-old boy has two years of right foot pain that prevent participation in athletic activities. Uh, he's attempted and failed bracing. His hind foot is supple, uh, and he has full dorsiflexion. 
so the preferred response is number four, calcaneal neck lengthening osteotomy. Uh, about two-thirds of you got that right. Uh, lateral calcaneal slide osteotomy is indicated for varus hindfoot deformity. Um, the other answers uh, were uh, infrequently chosen, uh, but the other, uh, but the preferred response is number four. Both bone forearm fracture. Twelve-year-old boy fell sustaining a both bone forearm fracture. Which of the following is true regarding the radiographic assessment of anatomic forearm alignment after reduction? Both bone forearm fractures are quite common. <clears throat> uh, they can typically be treated closed um, with closed reduction and casting. It's important to know the criteria to look for radiographically to, uh, to outline an uh, acceptable reduction. And usually those criteria include uh, less than 5 degrees of deformity in the AP uh, view and less than 10 degrees uh, of deformity uh, in the lateral view um, up to about age 10. These are acceptable criteria. Also, uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 to 30 degrees of rotational deformity seems to be well tolerated by patients. Now, a rotational guide uh, on the AP view is that the radial styloid should be opposite the bicipital tuberosity, and this is 180 degrees opposite. So on the AP view, uh, you can see uh, after reduction and healing on those right two films, the bicipital tuberosity is pointing medially and the radial uh, styloid uh, is, point, is, is pointing uh, laterally, and they're 180 degrees from each other. Uh, on the lateral view, you can see that the ulnar styloid uh, is opposite the coronoid process, and on the far right uh, radiograph, you can see uh, that that's the case as well. Back to the question, the 12-year-old boy fell, sustaining the both bone forearm fracture. Which uh, parameters tell you that they are anatomically aligned? And once again, the preferred response is four. And you can see that the radial styloid and the tuberosity are 180 degrees apart on this AP film. Uh, about 60% uh, of you got this question right. Um, about 30% answered uh, five. Uh, and that's the, the radiograph and the radial styloid and tuberosity are 90 degrees apart when it's actually 180 degrees. They should be on opposite sides of the bone. Shirley from the Moores Children's Clinic in Jacksonville, Florida, and I'm going to review the next set of questions. The first topic will be leg length discrepancy. A 14-year-old boy sustains a significant distal femoral physeal fracture. Assuming that he has a complete growth arrest, what is the predicted leg length discrepancy? In order to answer this question, you need to know about predicting limb length discrepancies and normal lower extremity growth. The methods to project limb length discrepancy at maturity include the arithmetic methods, the growth remaining method, the Mosley straight line graph, and the multiplier method. The arithmetic method makes a few assumptions about lower extremity growth. These include that the magnitude of growth of the proximal femur is three millimeters per year, that the distal femur is 10 millimeters per year, the proximal tibia is six millimeters per year, and the distal tibia is five millimeters per year. And these growth magnitudes continue until growth stops at age 16 in boys and 14 in girls. So knowing that the distal femur physis grows a centimeter per year, and that there is two, two centimeters of or two years of growth remaining, you are able to select choice two, and almost everyone got that answer correctly. The next topic is the accessory navicular. An 18 year old male complains of a painful prominence over his medial midfoot for the past two years. Anti inflammatories and orthotics have failed to provide relief. Physical exam demonstrates a firm, non mobile, tender bump on the medial midfoot with no skin changes. A radiograph is provided in figure A. Which of the following is the best treatment option? So this question requires you to make the diagnosis from the radiographs and know the appropriate treatment. The radiographs show an accessory navicular in a skeletally mature patient. This is a normal variant seen in up to 12% of the population. It's often associated with pest planus 
and it might cause medial arch pain. And if it does, the first line treatments are non-operative. Operative treatment is indicated after six months of non-operative attempts, and this involves excision of the accessory navicular. Rerouting or advancement of the posterior tibialis tendon does not approve an associated flat foot, and in order to correct that, you would need to do additional techniques. So knowing this information about the accessory navicular, you are able to select choice five, surgical excision, and almost everyone made that response. The next question is radial head subluxation, or nursemaid's elbow. A three-year-old boy holds his elbow in a flexed and pronated position and refuses to use it after his mother called him by the hand as he fell down some stairs. The child would not rotate the forearm and clenches his elbow. Radiographs are negative for fracture. What is the most appropriate course of action? In order to answer this question, you need to recognize from this vignette that the patient has a nursemaid's elbow. This is due to longitudinal traction on the extended arm, which results in interposition of the annular ligament in the radiocapitellar joint. The arm subsequently rests in flexion and pronation. The radiographs are often normal, although they might show slight translation of the radial head, but not a true dislocation. Treatment consists of reduction by supinating the forearm and flexing the elbow. You want to position your thumb over the radial head in order to feel the reduction of the annular ligament. Therefore, the answer to this question is number three, close reduction in elbow flexion and supination. And again, most respondents made the appropriate answer. The next topic is tibial tubercle fractures. A 14-year-old boy sustains the injury shown in figure A. He subsequently develops compartment syndrome and requires fasciotomy. Injury to what artery is most likely responsible? The radiographs demonstrate a tibial tubercle fracture, which is markedly displaced in a nearly skeletally mature patient. So this is a common fracture in adolescent boys. The proximal tibial physis closure begins centrally and then progresses to the tubercle. And treatment consists of ORIF for displaced fractures in order to restore the extensor mechanism. Complications include recurvatum deformity and compartment syndrome. Compartment syndrome is due to an injury of the anterior tibial recurrent artery from the tubercle fracture. This artery arises superiorly to supply the anterior knee. Therefore, you should consider a prophylactic anterior compartment fasciotomy when performing open reduction internal fixation of these fractures. Knowing this information, you are able to select choice five, anterior tibial recurrent artery, and the majority of the respondents had the answer. The next topic is cavo varus foot. What is the preferred orthotic device for a symptomatic adult foot deformity that is shown in figure A has no arthritis on radiographs and responds to Coleman block testing as shown in figure B. Figure A demonstrates a cavus foot, which is also has hind foot varus, and figure B shows the correction of that hind foot varus. A cavus foot is an elevation of the medial arch from relative forefoot equinus. It is caused by spasticity of the contracted plantar fascia and weakness of the tibialis anterior. There are multiple neurologic causes which require further evaluation, and these include Charcot-Marie tooth, Friedreich's ataxia, spinal cord lesions, cerebral palsy, and polio. The Coleman block test evaluates the flexibility of hind foot varus. What you do is place a block under the lateral foot in order to eliminate the contribution of the plantar flexed first ray and therefore a flexible varus hind foot will correct the neutral while a rigid will not. Non-operative treatment consists of an orthotic which corrects the hind foot varus via lateral post and includes a depression for the first ray. So knowing this information about the cava varus foot, you are able to select choice five. 
Some were confused about the medial versus lateral hind foot post, but remember it's the lateral post which will correct the hind foot varus. The next topic is internal tibial torsion. A two-year-old boy is brought to your clinic by his mother for being pigeon-toed. Each of the following measurements found on physical exam are a routine part of the lower extremity profile except both figures A and B demonstrate measuring the thigh foot angle, figure C measures the Q angle, figure D is a measure of the heel bisector, and figure E is the foot progression angle. Remember that the rotational profile consists of the following. The foot progression angle, which is a measure of the overall alignment of the lower limb or rotation, and is observed by watching the child walk and is the angle between the foot and a straight line. Hip rotation, which is, term, which is an estimator of femoral aniversion with increased hip internal rotation being a sign of increased hip femoral aniversion. And then the thigh foot angle and the transmalleolar axis, which are both measurements of tibial torsion. And finally, the heel bisector test is a measurement of metatarsus adductus. Remember about internal tibial torsion, that this is due to intrauterine positioning, that parents might know tripping, but there's no evidence that these are correlated, and bracing does not change the natural history. And this typically resolves by ages four to eight years. So because the Q angle is not a part of the lower extremity rotational profile, the correct answer is C. The next topic is pediatric tibia fractures. A three year and six month old child fell while playing with his friends two hours ago and has avoided bearing weight on the right leg since that time. The child is afebrile and exam reveals tenderness along the distal tibial shaft with no significant swelling. Radiographs are shown in figures A and B. What is the most appropriate treatment? The radiographs here demonstrate a non-displaced tibial shaft fracture. Now toddler fractures of the tibia can occur after minimal trauma. They're often non-displaced with an intact fibula and they can be treated with cast immobilization. With toddler fractures, the initial radiographs are often negative. However, you should immobilize the patients in a cast if a fracture is the most likely diagnosis. Keep infection in the differential and evaluate for osteomyelitis with labs and other studies at the initial visit if the child presents with signs of infection or at the follow-up if you don't see any callus on the radiographs. So recognizing that the radiographs demonstrated a tibial shaft fracture and knowing that minimal trauma is required to cause this fracture, you are able to select four long leg application, long leg cast application. The next topic is septic arthritis of the hip. An eight month old infant is brought by his parents to your office for fever and malaise. Your inspection of the patient is detailed in image A. An oral temperature of greater than 38.5 degrees Celsius has been found to be the best predictor of this child's condition. What is the second best predictor? So the best predictors of the septic hip in order are fever, CRP greater than two, ESR greater than 40, an inability to bear weight, and an elevated white blood cell count. And these are based out of a study from the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And you sort of need to know this specific study in order to answer the question. Remember with septic arthritis that inoculation results from hematogenous or directly from the bone. In the neonates, there are transficial vessels which can cause the infection. And remember the joints with an intraarticular metaphysis. And these include the hip, the shoulder, the elbow, and the ankle. Also remember the common bacterial causes. In patients less than 12 months, the nosocomial cause is staphylococcus, and the acute immunity acquired cause is group B streptococcus. In two to 12 years of age, the most common cause is staphylococcus. And in adolescence, 
the most common cause is Neisseria gonorrhea. So, knowing these best predictors of the septic hip, you are able to select answer four. And this was a difficult question, and unfortunately one that essentially requires you to know that specific paper by Caret et al. Fortunately, there are a lot of questions on tests that do not require you to memorize a specific paper. The next question or topic is brachial plexus injuries. An infant is born with total brachial plexus palsy and Horner syndrome after a difficult vaginal delivery. What is the prognosis for spontaneous recovery of motor function in the involved arm by three months of age? So this question requires you to know about brachial plexus injuries. These are not very common at one in 3,000 births and are due to a stretch or contusion. 90% of cases will resolve without intervention. Most cases can be observed with passive motion because of those good results. The worst prognosis is seen with total plexus injuries, especially when this is associated with a preganglion injury and a Horner syndrome, and these will have less than a 10% chance of spontaneous recovery. Remember the common types of brachial plexus palsy, herbs or upper trunk, clunkies or lower trunk, and total plexus. Early surgery is for the complete flail arm or Horner syndrome. And this is done with microsurgical nerve repair or nerve grafting. Later surgery consists of tendon transfer or osteotomies for internal rotation contractures of the shoulder or pectoralis transfers for decreased elbow flexion. Knowing this information about brachial plexus injuries, you are able to select choice five. The next question is radial neck fractures. A 12-year-old boy falls eight feet from a tree limb and lands on his outstretched hand. He complains of elbow pain and a displaced radial neck fracture is located on the radiographs. Close reduction is attempted with sedation and post-reduction radiographs are provided. Which of the following actions should be taken? So the radiographs demonstrate a radial neck fracture with greater than 45 degrees of angulation. Radial neck fractures often occur with other injuries and can result in a flipped radial head, which you want to be sure to identify. Treatment is primarily based on angulation. If there is less than 30 degrees of angulation, these should be immobilized. If there is more than 30 degrees of angulation, close reduction should be performed and there are multiple techniques described. After your close reduction attempt, surgery is indicated for greater than 30 degrees of residual angulation or 5 millimeters of translation. This can be done percutaneously with the K-wire or the Metazo method. Open reduction can be performed if this percutaneous method or further closed reduction attempts in the OR are unsuccessful. The exact indication for an open reduction is not well determined but ranges between 30 and 60 degrees of angulation. Fixation should be performed if the reduction is unstable, and this is not always necessary. In general, you want to minimize your duration of immobilization and re reduce the fracture without opening the fracture in order to decrease your risk of stiffness. So, knowing the tolerances for radial neck fractures, you are able to select choice five operative reduction and fixation. This does not necessarily mean open reduction. It just means closed reduction or percutaneous reduction in the OR after your initial attempt has in outside of the OR has failed. The next topic is growth and proximal humerus fractures. Which of the following answers represents the ratio of growth from the proximal and distal growth plates in a humerus, respectively? So this requires you to know the individual contributions of growth plates to the normal upper limb growth. Limb growth in the arms is 40% from the shoulder, 20% from the elbows, and 40% from the wrist. Bone growth in the humerus is 80% proximal, 20% distal, and the forearm is the opposite of this. So therefore, with proximal humerus fractures, 
you have enormous remodeling potential and almost any amount of displacement and angulation can be accepted in a child with an open physis whereas in children greater than 12 years of age you want less than 40 degrees of angulation or between one half and two thirds of displacement. For the lower limb, in general, remember that growth occurs at the knee and remember for the upper limb that growth occurs away from the elbow. Therefore, knowledge of the humerus growth pattern allows you to select number one, 80 colon 20. And the majority of you were able to get this correct. The next question is about pediatric resuscitation. A five-year-old boy, I'm sorry, five-year-old girl presents after being struck by a vehicle in her driveway. She has multiple injuries, including a right femur fracture, open book pelvis, bilateral clavicle fractures. Peripheral IV access cannot be obtained in the trauma bay, and the patient's blood pressure is 110 over 70. Which of the following is the most appropriate method to obtain vascular access. So you need to recognize that the patient is hypotensive and does not have peripheral access. In addition, the patient has clavicle fractures, which are certainly problematic for subclavian lines. So interosseous lines for pediatric trauma are actually the line of choice in patients less than age seven when peripheral access can't be obtained. In older patients, the harder bone makes this more difficult to obtain. They're easily inserted and they have low complication rates. Other key points about pediatric trauma are that this is the most common cause of death in children and that CNS injuries have the highest morbidity and mortality among all injuries. That spine fractures have the highest morbidity and mortality among musculoskeletal injuries and that children can remain hemodynamically unstable even after significant blood loss. And remember that pediatric blood volume is about 75 milliliters per kilogram. So, knowing that the interosseous line is a safe option, you are able to select number one, placement of an interosseous infusion device. The next topic is the elbow. Which of the following elbow apophyses is the last to fuse during growth? So this requires you to know about the maturation of the pediatric elbow, whereas almost everyone remembers the order of appearance of the apophyses. So the fusion of the elbow occurs as follows. The capitellum, lateral epicondyle, and the trochlea form one epiphyseal center at age 10 in girls and 12 in boys. And this center fuses with the distal humeral metaphysis at 13 in girls and 15 in boys. The medial epicondyle is the last part to fuse with the metaphysis, and that occurs at 14 in girls and around 17 in boys. What most remember is the order of appearance of the elbow growth centers. Capitellum, followed by radius, followed by medial epicondyle, then trochlea, then olecranon, and then the lateral epicondyle, with about two years of range between males and females. So knowing the order of closure of the elbow apophyses, you are able to select number four, medial epicondyle. And this was a really hard question with the majority of the respondents selecting the external epicondyle. Um, because again, I think most of us remember the order of appearance and not the order of closure. And hopefully those slides have made those facts more clear. The next topic is sickle cell anemia. A three-year-old African-American child presents with irritability, fever, and a warm swollen leg. Imaging shows an area concerning for osteomyelitis and transcortical biopsy reveals multiple salmonella species. This child most likely also has which of the following conditions? This question requires you to know the orthopedic manifestations of sickle cell disease. These include osteomyelitis, septic arthritis, dactylitis, which is acute hand and foot swelling, osteonecrosis, bone infarcts, and growth retardation. 
Osteomyelitis can certainly occur in sickle cell patients, and when it does, Staph aureus is the most common cause, while Salmonella is the most characteristic cause, and this occurs from seeding from the gallbladder infections or bowel necrosis. Remember when these patients present that the ESR may not be elevated. Another diagnostic fact is that radionuclide bone and bone marrow scans can be helpful for the diagnosis. As osteomyelitis will show an abnormal bone scan, but normal marrow uptake, but this is decreased in infarcts. So, knowing the causes of osteomyelitis in patients with sickle cell disease, you are able to select number four, sickle cell anemia. Last section in pediatrics, there'll be 18 questions, the first of which is regarding leg calvae perthes disease. A six-year-old boy presents with left leg pain and limping. Radiographs are shown in figures A and B. The radiographic changes necessary for accurate lateral pillar classification of his disease are usually evident how long after the onset of symptoms. Before what we have, or excuse me, below what we have is the AP pelvis and frog lateral hip radiographs of this six-year-old boy. You can see the typical stigmata associated with Percy's disease involving the left capital femoral pipsis, where you have shortening of the lateral pillar consistent with early Percy's disease. Let's go into what we need to know to answer this question. Perthes is very common, affects boys more than girls, and usually between the ages of four and six. Lateral pillar classification has significant prognostic value. The best time to make lateral pillar classification on radiographs is in the early fragmentation phase, which is typically at about six months after onset of symptoms. Lateral pillar classification is A, B, and C, with A being no loss in lateral pillar height. B being up to 50% loss in height, and C more than 50% loss in height. Let's go back to the question. What this question is really asking is, at what phase in Perthes disease can you make an accurate lateral pillar classification? The correct answer or preferred response is three or six months, and I see that 54% of you got this correct question correct. <clears throat> A third of you picked number two, which is three months of age, or three months into onset of symptoms. This is just one of those typical things that you need to know, a piece of information that you need to know in order to answer this question correctly. Next topic is Sprengel's disorder. A four-year-old boy with clipophile syndrome has elevation of the left scapula since birth. Spying radiographs show no evidence of scoliosis. What shoulder motion is likely to be most limited? Again, let's go through some typical findings in Sprengel's deformity. First of all, it's very commonly associated with clipophile syndrome. It's a failure of scapular uh, descent and can mimic scoliosis, as you can see in the two patients on the right-hand side of the slide. There are commonly also associated upper extremity anomalies. Typically presents with a high, smaller scapula and mimics scoliosis due to the asymmetry associated. As you can see in the slides, photographs on the bottom half of this slide, Abduction is most severely limited, as depicted in the central and the right-sided slide. The treatment is typically observation, but you can do resection if there's no more vertebral bone in order to bring the scapula down to its normal position, thereby improving its functional capabilities. Back to the question. A four-year-old boy with clipophile syndrome has elevation of left scapula since birth. Spine radiographs show no evidence of scoliosis. What shoulder motion is most likely to be limited. You guys did fantastic on this question where 83% of you picked the correct answer, which is abduction, question number, answer number two. Posterior medial bowing of the tibia. An infant is born with a unilateral lower extremity deformity. A clinical photo is shown in figure A. Radiographs are shown in figure B. Which of the following conditions are associated with this type of deformity? As you can see in the photograph of the child, in the lower left. This is a very alarming or stark appearing deformity, which can, is a, which can be alarming to the family, as well as the treating physician if they're not aware of the disorder. In the AP and lateral radiographs seen on the right-hand side of the slide, you can see definite posterior and medial bowing of this lower extremity. For posterior medial bowing, you need to know that there's an associated calcaneal valgus foot position, often even more severe than you saw on the previous slide. The typical 
findings is that this will spontaneously correct. With time, occasionally the foot will need to be casted, but rarely. Almost always it will resolve spontaneously. The most prevailing uh, thing to find with posterior bowing of the tibia is about a two to five centimeter limb length discrepancy at skeletal maturity, as you can see in this child, as an infant on the left or toddler on the left, and as an adolescent on the right. Back to the question. What they really want to make sure you understand is that this is not something that's related to pseudoarthrosis of the tibia like anterior lateral bowing would be, and instead a residual limb length discrepancy, and you guys did an excellent job on this with 75% of you getting the correct answer. Mucopolysaccharidoses. Children with lysosomal storage diseases have increased rates of which of the following disorders? Syringomyelia, pectus excavatum, micrognathism, carpal tunnel syndrome, and thoracic kyphosis. Essentially what you need to know in any mucopolysaccharidosis is that it's a storage disorder. So therefore they're going to have lots of whatever the byproduct is that needs to be stored throughout the body. The tissue affinity depends on the proteoglycan and thus accounts for the variable clinic, clinical manifestations. All of these patients have increased risk for carpal tunnel syndrome because of these storage issues. Hurler syndrome <clears throat> uh, leads to dermatin sulfate accumulation. San Filippo's heparin sulfate accumulation. And Morquio's keratin sulfate accumulation. Back to the question. As a general question regarding mucopolysaccharidoses, because they're storage disorders, they intend to build up in areas where there um, is free space, if you will, such as the carpal tunnel, and can lead to things uh, causing nerve compression like carpal tunnel syndrome. 54% of you got this answer correct. 5% of you picked, or excuse me, 23% of you picked answer 5, which is thoracic kyphosis. That's an excellent um, guess, if you will, because uh, there is a lot of spinal deformity associated with mucopolysaccharidosis, but not specifically thoracic kyphosis. So once again, carpal tunnel syndrome is the right answer. Clidocranial disostosis. An eight-year-old boy presents with an extreme shoulder motion and frontal bossing. Chest radiograph and AP pelvis radiograph are shown below. What is the most likely diagnosis? Let's first skip to the chest x-ray. For an orthopedic surgeon, the first thing that I notice when I look at this chest x-ray is the stark absence of the clavicles, bilaterally. On the AP pelvis x-ray on the right, you can see a lack of symphysis pubis in the midline, as well as congenitive uh, coxa vera, worse on the left side than it is on the right side. <clears throat> so what they, they want to know what the most likely diagnosis is, clitocranial dysplasia, renal osteodystrophy, spondyloepiphyseal dysplasia, hypothyroidism, or bilateral slip capital femoral epiphysis. Cladocranial dysplasia, or dysostosis, has all the typical stigmata mentioned in the previous question. A widened cranium, micrognathia, clavicle dysplasia, complete or partial absence, a narrow pelvis without symphysis, and scoliosis. Failure formation of the midline structures, an autosomal dominant penetration, and bilateral coxivera are typical stigmata. To the question. An eight-year-old boy presents with extreme shoulder motion and frontal bossing. The shoulder motion extremes are due to the lack of the clavicles, and you guys had 98% correct at cladocranial dysplasia. So excellent work on that question. Vertical talus. What is the preferred treatment for newly diagnosed irreducible congenital vertical talus in a toddler? Casting followed by open reduction in Achilles lengthening, serial poncetti casting, percutaneous Achilles lengthening, talectomy with tendon interposition, or subtalar fusion with soft tissue release. First of all, you need to know that with vertical talus, it'll be presented with multiple different types or names, such as convex pes valgus, rocker bottom foot, or talopes equino valgus. The clinical appearance is such as you see in the infant picture on the left-hand side. Often associated with syndromes, with spina bifida and chromosomal abnormalities leading the way. X-ray diagnoses are, are key and very testable material and very commonly asked. The X-ray you see on the right, you see the flat on the flat surface on the dorsal surface of the foot near the red arrow. This is because this is a plantar flexion lateral view X-ray. 
This is an attempt to see if the navicular will line up and reduce with the talus. If it does not and remains dorsally dislocated, then you have a vertical talus radiographically. Casting is used to stretch the tight soft tissues, but usually not able to completely reduce the talonavicular joint. And a surgical release is usually necessary at or about six to nine months of age. So back to the question. What they're really asking is, what do you need to do to treat congenital vertical talus? And specifically, what different things do you need to do than you would do with a typical idiopathic clubfoot? With an idiopathic clubfoot, the answer would be two, serial ponseti casting. However, with vertical talus, because we're not typically able to completely reduce the talonavicular joint, casting followed by open reduction in Achilles tendon lengthening is the appropriate answer. And I'm thrilled to see that 87% of you got the correct answer, which is number one. Diastrophic dysplasia. What is the genetic cause of the dwarfism characterized by a hitchhiker's thumb, cauliflower swelling of the ears, and severe club feet? FGFR2, FGFR3, sulfate transport protein, CBFA1, or GS alpha protein. What this is basically making you do in this question is recognize what diastrophic dysplasia is. The term diastrophic implies twisted or distorted um, form of dwarfism. It's an autosomal recessive phenomenon and is characterized by a mutation on the sulfate transporter protein with undersulfation of the proteoglycans throughout the body. The typical stigmata mentioned in this question, cauliflower ear, hitchhiker's thumb, cervical spina bifida and cervical kyphosis are two are several of the very significant this, uh, musculoskeletal issues associated with this disorder. They have a very short stature and again the twisted dwarf with severe club feet, hitchhiker thumbs, and significant spinal deformities as well. Back to the question. What they're asking you here is they know it's a known genetic cause and they want to know want you to know what is the mutation and what does the mutation's product. In this instance, that is number three, a sulfate transport protein. And 84% of you got this correct, which is fantastic. Marfan syndrome. Marfan syndrome is an autosomal dominant disorder which results from a defective gene encoding for what? Again, a gene byproduct question. Number one, elastin. Number two, fibrillin. Number three, fibroblast growth factor. Number four, collagen type one. And number five, collagen type two. The, an the answers to the questions that you need to know for Marfan syndrome involve this chromosome 15. Occasionally, it'll throw that curveball in there to make sure you understand that's the location. But fibrillin is the product of that chromosome and that location. They have an arm span greater than the height, the lens dislocations, mitral valve prolapse, and significant ligamentous hyperlaxity. The musculoskeletal elements include scoliosis and significant arachnodactyly. So back to the question, this is just an answer that you have to know these products in order to understand and answer this question correctly. Very excited to see that 93% of you get the correct answer, which is number two, fibrillin. Tarsal coalition and perineal spastic flat foot. A 13-year-old girl presents to the office for the first time with a history of recurrent ankle sprains while playing soccer. Clinical examination demonstrates pes planus. A radiograph shown in figure A, what is the most appropriate next step in treatment? Let's look at the x-ray below and see what we have first. We can see that we have an abnormal connection between the talus, excuse me, between the navicular and the calcaneus as seen in the direct center of this radiograph. Classic radiograph for a calcaneal navicular coalition. The question, however, wants you to answer the question, what is the most appropriate treatment from the get-go? First of all, calcaneal navicular coalitions are the most common cause of spastic flat feet, or pes planus. Commonly, they present as recurrent ankle sprains, as seen in this question, and other causes may include trauma or inflammatory disorders, such as JRA. A calcaneal navicular bar may be seen on the oblique view as we saw in the radiographs in this question. The initial treatment is always going to be casting or some form of conservative measure. If you go down the route of surgical management or failed conservative management, a CT scan is advisable as there can be secondary or additional coalitions in the hind foot. <clears throat> the talocalcaneal coalition requires CT to measure the percentage of the joint involved. And when 50% or less of the joint is involved, resection is an okay alternative. 
more extensive involvement requires more aggressive procedures, such as an arthrodesis. So back to the question. It's a 13-year-old girl who specifically, say, presents with recurrent ankle sprains while playing soccer. The most appropriate next step in treatment, and this answer is five, cast immobilization, because they don't give you any delineation of any other conservative treatment attempted thus far. 59% of you got this answer correct. 38% of you picked option two, which is coalition excision. I think that answer would be correct had they in the question mentioned that they tried casting previously and failed in that conservative measure. But since they did not, conservatism will be the appropriate answer, and it's cast immobilization. Montasia fracture. A four-year-old girl sustains a buccal fracture of the ulna and an associated radial head dislocation. Closed reduction and immobilization of the arm in 110 degrees of flexion, as falling allows, and full supination enhances the stability of the injury by which of the following? Tightening of the interosseous membrane, tightening of the biceps, eliminating plastic deformation, relaxing the pronator quadratus, or protecting the posterior interosseous nerve. With Montasia fractures in children, it's key to make sure that the x-rays they give you have the elbow and the wrist in the film, or that they explain it to you as they did in this particular question. That is in incredibly important as you need to make sure that the radial head reduces. Casting these in hyperflexion and supination relaxes the biceps and tightens the interosseous membrane, thereby enhancing your chances of maintaining a reduction. So back to the question, 78% of you got this correct, that hyperflexion and full supination enhances stability by tightening the interosseous membrane. The key part of this question that makes it correct is that they, as swelling allows. A lot of these children will be very swollen and you may not be able to hyperflex due to safety reasons for compartment issues. Skippies, slip capital femoral epiphysis. A 13 year old obese boy complains of a three month history of left knee, thigh and groin pain. His pain has significantly worsened over the past week. He denies pain in the right leg. Radiographs are taken and shown in figures A and B. The history and physical do not reveal any findings concerning for an endocrine disorder. What is the preferred method of treatment? Well, let's look at the x-rays that we have below. On the left-hand side, we have an AP pelvis, and on the right-hand side, a frog lateral x-ray of the left hip in particular, which is where he's symptomatic. You can see rarefaction or widening of the, of the physis in this proximal femur. And on the frog lateral, you can see a slight slippage of, of the epiphysis in that regard. So the questions that the, the answers they have for this question are subtrochosteotomy, non-weight bearing for the left side for six weeks, bilateral in situ fixation, in situ single screw fixation across the left physis only, or various rotational osteotomy of the proximal femur. Well, first let's go through some key thing informations to know, key pieces of information to know about slip capital femoral epiphysis. It most commonly occurs in overweight males during their rapid growth spurt. By far, the number one treatment on any question asked will be pin in situ or wear reduced by positioning without force. Endocrine workups are necessary if the child is less than 10 years of age or has other stigmata associated uh, with endocrinologies. Pinning bilateral is definitely indicated if there are endocrinopathies, and this is something that they will have to allude to in the, end, in the question in order for this to be correct. Back to the question. The preferred response, accordingly, is in situ single screw insertion across the left proximal femoral physis only. 94% of you got this answer correct, which is absolutely fantastic. An 11-year-old obese male presents with a slip capital femoral epiphysis. Which of the following figures accurately represents the methods used to determine the radiographic severity of the epiphyseal slip and help to guide treatment? You can see on the left-hand side, the farthest to the left, is an epiphyseal diaphyseal angle. The second from the left is Klein's line drawn on the superior aspect of the femoral neck. The acetabular index is the central photograph. Shenton's line is the line drawn from the femoral neck through the obturator foramen. <clears throat> and the center edge angle is the furthest to the right. So slip capital femoral epiphysis has, an ins has a 
scenario where the femoral neck is displaced anteriorly and externally. The Southwick, Southwick severity angle is what was depicted in this question and is the answer. <clears throat> the epiphyseal shaft angle is the key, with the difference being mild of less than 30 degrees, moderate 30 to 50 degrees, and severe greater than 50 degrees. An 11-year-old boy presents with the above-mentioned scenario. The preferred answer is 1, and I'm delighted to see that 81% of you got this answer correct. Developmental dysplasia of the hip. Which of the following concepts regarding pediatric hips is true? The proximal femoral physis and greater trochanteric apophysis developed from different cartilaginous physis. The proximal femoral physis grows at a rate of 9 millimeters per year. Normal infant femoral antiversion is between 10 and 20 degrees. The ossific nucleus of the proximal femur is visible on radiographs by six months of age in most children. And slip capital femoral epiphysis typically occurs through the zone of pro proliferation. So again, they want to know which one of these is true. So let's go through some typical information that's needed to answer questions on developmental dysplasia of the hip. First of all, on the slide you can see below with the x-ray, the red line that's just horizontal is Hilgenreiner's line. And the blue line, which is vertical, is Perkins' line. That divides the hip into four quadrants, as you can see in the, in the radiograph below. The proximal femoral of ossific nucleus appears at six months of age. If you can draw these lines on the x-ray, which they'll have to show you on the question, you can make the diagnosis without the presence of an ossific nucleus, which is why they're asking you this question. So back to the question. The correct answer is four. The ossific nucleus of the proximal femur is visible on radiographs. And 70% of you got this answer correct, which is answer four. Looks like about a fourth of you picked answer one, the proximal femoral physis and greater trochanteric apophysis developed from different cartilaginous physis. Actually, in the proximal femur, those two physis are congruous with each other and don't separate until later in development. Neurofibromatosis. All of the following are associated with neurofibromatosis except. So be leery of questions that say except or which is correct to make sure that you read it thoroughly. Smooth bordered cafe au lait spots, posterior medial bowing of the tibia, short sharp dystrophic scoliosis, cutaneous neuromas, an autosomal dominant transmission from mutated neurofibroma gene. So with neurofibromatosis, the NF1 gene is located on chromosome 21 and has been labeled neurofibromin. Typically they present with cafe au lait spots that are smooth, have smooth borders, hemihypertrophy as you see on the right, significant sharply angulated scoliosis, and anterior lateral bowing of the tibia compared to the posterior medial bowing that we talked about earlier in this section. Plexiform neurofibromas are a hallmark and pathognomonic for neurofibromatosis. So back to the question. All the following are associated with neurofibromatosis except 88% of you got this correct, except posterior medial bowing of the tibia, and that's correct because anterior lateral bowing is what's associated with neurofibromatosis. The rest of those are correct. Achondroplasia. Dwarfism caused by a defect in fibroblast growth factor 3, FGFR3, is associated with all of the following traits except, again, an except question, rhizomelic limb shortening, normal intelligence, frontal bossing, cervical spine instability, and spinal stenosis. Achondroplasia is the most common skeletal dysplasia. It's autosomal dominant in presentation, and FGFR3 mutation is the hallmark. The typical physical stigmata seen are frontal bossing, foramen magnum stenosis, rhizomelic limb shortening, and thoracal lumbar kyphosis, as well as lumbar stenosis. They typically have a champagne pelvis, as you can see in the lower left, and significant shortening of the pedicles, which is what leads to the stenosis. So back to the question, which of the following are not associated with FGFR3 or achondroplasia? The correct answer here is four, cervical spine instability, 
All of the others are typical stigmata of achondroplasia, and 84% of you got this correct, which is excellent. Osteogenesis imperfecta. Which of the following pediatric congenital disorders is caused by a glycine substitution in a pro-collagen molecule? Scurvy, osteogenesis imperfecta, fibrous dysplasia, diastrophic dysplasia, or ochronosis? OI, or osteogenesis imperfecta, is an inability to make normal type 1 collagen at normal rates. Typical stigmata is a glycine substitution on the pro-collagen molecule, which then leads to abnormal cross-linking and hence the in inability to make normal type 1 collagen. So this question is just a tidbit of information that you have to know about osteogenesis imperfecta in order to get correct. And incredibly, 77% of you got this right, which is fantastic. issues so I can understand that confusion. Charcot Marie Tooth. A 22 year old woman is concerned about frequent ankle sprains and an awkward gait. Lower extremity nerve conduction velocities show prolonged distal latencies in the perineal nerves. DNA testing shows a duplication of chromosome 17. Which of the following images is most likely the radiograph of this patient? Well the image on the left shows an accessory navicular. <clears throat> the, the image uh, in the upper image in the middle shows a calcaneonavicular coalition. The lower image in the middle shows what appears to be a cavus foot. The upper image on the right is a normal x-ray. And the lower image on the right shows a ball and socket angle, typical of multiple hind foot coalitions. Charcot Marie Tooth disease is an autosomal dominant disorder that, re that causes cavus feet, hammer toes, and mainly motor deficits. The most affected muscles are the anterior tibialis, perineus brevis, and the intrinsic muscles of the foot and the hand. Back to the question Which of these images shows that typical x ray consistent with Charcot Marie Tooth disease? And it is the preferred response is image C which is 73% of you got this correct, which is excellent. Myelodysplasia, or spina bifida. A four-year-old girl with an L2 myelomeningocele presents for routine follow-up. <laughs> Pelvic radiographs reveal a complete dislocation of the hip with well-formed acetabulum and a normal right hip. Her gait is symmetric with use of a walker and a brace, which of the following treatment options should be offered to the patient at this time. Right-sided femoral shortening osteotomy, continued observation and routine follow-up, left greater, greater trochanter advancement, left-sided pelvic osteotomy, or open reduction of the left hip. Hip dislocations are a beloved question in myelodysplasia. The photograph at the bottom of the slide depicts why L3 and L4 are the most common levels to have hip dislocations. Simply, you have unopposed flexion and abduction of the hip in these individuals. Surgical treatment is very controversial. L3 and higher levels almost always are treated with observation, even in the most aggressive centers. Back to the question. 66% of you picked option two, which is continued observation and follow-up. And the reason that's correct is this question says that this is an L2 level myelomeningocele. So L3 levels and higher have very poor results with attempts at, re at uh, reconstructive maneuvers. And the other third of you that didn't pick answer two picked five, which probably would be correct if this was an L4 or L5 <coughs> level spina bifida. Osteopetrosis. An enzymatic mutation leading to abnormal carbonic anhydrase function in osteoclasts would lead to the condition best illustrated by which of the following x-rays in figures A through E. In figure A, you can see a loss of normal definition in the metaphyseal region of the femurs. Figure B looks most like pagets in the left hemipelvis and right proximal femur. Figure C, typical stigmata seen with melareostosis and candle wax type material. And figure E, a bone infarct. Figure D has the appearance of a malignancy with ill-defined borders on the x-ray. Osteopetrosis is an autosomal recessive disorder that maps to chromosome 11. 
It's a failure of osteoclasts to remodel and is specifically due to a carbonic anhydrase dysfunction. There's a very high mortality rate and the treatment is largely with bone marrow transplant. The x-rays you see below are typical with lack of osteoclastic remodeling of the metastases. A rugger jersey spine as seen on the right. So as you can see on the right with a rugger jersey spine, the correct answer on this one is going to be figure A, which is number one. About half of you picked figure B. So the correct answer on this is figure A as it is osteoclast, uh, osteoclast remodeling disorder uh, leading to osteopetrosis. And that concludes this section.